so uh, uh, people ask me what I do for a living, and I tell them that my uh, research group is all about trying to make sense of clinical data. Uh, so today we're going to talk about uh, reuse of clinical data, clinical data warehousing, and what we're doing uh, at our institution with uh, clinical data opportunities, challenges, and future directions, kind of your standard talk. Uh, I like to take credit for other people's work. So these are the people whose work I'm taking credit for, um, uh, faculty on the left side and staff on the right side. The, the email address there is for our project manager. So um, if any of this uh, uh, interests you, she's a great person to contact uh, uh, or, or me, um, uh, uh, and I can direct you to her who does the real work. All right, so what, sorry. Uh, <laughs> So why might we want to reuse clinical data? Number one, we might want to learn from what we do, right? Uh, what works, what doesn't. Uh, we call that, uh, in the fancy world, comparative effectiveness research. Uh, we might want to optimize processes. If you've ever read uh, Atul Gawande's book, Better, he articulates this very well. Um, he compared uh, the best performing uh, cystic fibrosis center to the worst performing and found what uh, the, the big difference was really tracking exactly what uh, what gets done and making sure it gets done the same way the same time, uh, every time, excuse me. We might want to monitor uh, the population. We call that biosurveillance, whether that be for uh, uh, drug side effects or epidemics or what have you. And of course, we want to discover new things, uh, particularly new associations that lead to new hypotheses and discovery. Okay. It's also a matter of national competitiveness, and this is a little small, but I would just call your attention to the share of clinical trials that, occur, uh, that are conducted in the United States. And over uh, 10 years, uh, uh, ending in, I think, to, uh, 2005, the, um, the share of clinical trials has got, uh, that are conducted in the U.S. has gone down uh, by uh, an absolute over 10 percent. So in other words, from 50 uh, some percent to 40 some percent. These trials are moving to places, understandably, that have fewer um, restrictions on uh, human subjects research and uh, where such research is cheaper. So if you think about traditional research um, uh, models, whether these be clinical trials or observational studies or what have you, you ask a question, you design a study, you collect data, you analyze the data, you answer the question, and then you repeat. So particularly clinical trials are a very bright, focused, and very expensive light on a very specific question. So if I know exactly the question I want to ask, clinical trial is great. And uh, what we do with clinical data, or what we want to do with clinical data, is, is not a replacement for that. But certain questions are not amenable to a randomized clinical trial uh, or even an observational study uh, for, uh, for multiple reasons. One reason is that we can't design trials, for example, to, uh, uh, that will detect all possible side effects of a drug. You would, by definition, the statisticians tell me, need an, uh, a trial of infinite size and of infinite duration. That's expensive. Infinity is expensive. Uh, then there's also the issue of efficacy versus effectiveness. And the epidemiologists tell me that, uh, that there's a difference between the two. One is theoretical and one's in the real world. So how things work in the lab or under controlled conditions may or may not reflect um, uh, uh, the real world. Uh, studies of birth control would be a, a particularly uh, common example of that. Uh, things that are 100% effective in the lab may not be always 100% uh, effective in the clinic or in the, in the field, excuse me. So what we want to do is collect data we want to, uh, as a, that are generated as a byproduct of routine care. So you have a cold, you go see your doctor. Whether or not you get antibiotics, we want to uh, uh, detect that. We want to um, identify uh, uh, cases that are similar to yours, and we may want to uh, uh, determine whether antibiotics help the common cold. I, I don't want to hear anything from the pediatricians. So. Um, the problem with that is that when you collect data for routine care uh, and then try to reuse them for research, you violate the first law of informatics, which is that data shall uh, be used only for the purpose for which they are collected. And the collateral, which I particularly like, if no purpose was defined prior to the collection of the data, then the data should not be used. And by definition, we're violating that law when we try to reuse clinical data for research. And so we end up with, cha uh, with multiple challenges. And um, one way of categorizing these challenges are according to data, information, and knowledge challenges. And so 
Uh, data information and knowledge are terms that we throw around, particularly in conferences on data science or informatics. And uh, disclosure, uh, my, my disclosure is I'm not a data scientist, I am an informatician, and if you want to know the difference, I'm happy to discuss it. Uh, we actually wrote a paper about that. Um, so data are observations about the world. Excuse me. Uh, so uh, the sign up there, that's uh, two intersecting lines. Some of these data are meaningful. Those are uh, information. So a positive smoking history, for example, is something you might see in a, in a patient's chart. Knowledge, then, is justified true belief. And uh, an example of that might be that people who smoke have a higher uh, risk of lung cancer compared to people who do not smoke. We know that because we've collected data on smokers and we've done trials and so on and so forth. All right, these definitions come from um, analytic, a branch of analytic philosophy called philosophy of computation. These are the people that think about uh, computing and the terms that we use surrounding uh, um, uh, uh, computation. So then again, discovery, you ask a question, right? We call that a hypothesis. You collect observations, we call that data. We make sense of these observations, we transform data into information, and we derive some sort of justified true belief knowledge from the, uh, from the information, and then that might generate a new question and we repeat and so on. So challenges at the data level uh, relate largely to the collection, storage, and transmission of the said data. So uh, when we talk about big data, the challenges end up being things like how do we store and transmit this stuff? So, For example, the Institute for Molecular Medicine, which is um, right next to our, our building on, uh, on Fannin, uh, uh, had to shut down their sequencers because they ran out of disk space. So they were generating all these images, sorry, uh, and these are, uh, you know, big data problems. Uh, disk space turns out is fairly expensive and your R01 is all used up by disks, buying disks. So in contrast, small data, such as clinical data sets, uh, may be large, but rarely is the problem re related to the storage and transmission. The problems tend to be um, uh, uh, related to how we use them. Uh, the meaning of the data. So uh, just as, a, as an example, um, uh, I'm an adult people doctor, uh, so I deal with uh, um, uh, people that get pneumonia. And uh, the, the term pneumonia does not in and of itself uh, define a clinical scenario well enough to take any action. So for example, we don't know whether it's bacterial or viral pneumonia, unilobar affecting one part of the lung or multilobar. Excuse me. Is it uh, what kind of a, um, uh, of a pattern is it? Is it a slow, gradual pneumonia, an atypical pneumonia, or is it a rapid onset, um, a very sick patient, what we call a typical bacterial pneumonia? And so there's all sorts of context-dependent uh, factors that affect uh, what we see in, in the chart or that um, affect the interpretation of what we see in the chart. So um, a 90-year-old with pneumonia versus a 27-year-old graduate student with pneumonia, totally different diseases, different outcomes, different treatments, uh, uh, pretty much everything. Okay. So then there are knowledge change, uh, challenges. So how do we synthesize uh, these meaningful data, the information, into knowledge? Uh, and th there are statistical challenges, confounders, non-random missing data. Um, and so uh, just as an example, we looked at uh, whether prednisone causes weight gain. There are some clinicians in the audience. Does prednisone cause weight gain? We don't know. Okay. I, well, uh, generally, people uh, uh, think that it's one of the cardinal side effects of prednisone. When, and we have plenty of people who take prednisone for plenty long time in high enough dose and so on. Depending on what assumptions we make about how we analyze the data, so in other words, how much prednisone do you have to take for us to consider you as having taken prednisone? When, after taking prednisone, do we expect the weight gain to take place? Is it immediately so if you uh, take one pill of prednisone today, do I expect your weight to be higher five years from now? Um, or immediately, or somewhere in the middle. Uh, we have to make some assumptions there. You can't, you can't say, I'm going to analyze, the, uh, conduct this analysis agnostic of time, for example. Um, and depending on how we make those assumptions, we can show that prednisone uh, uh, causes weight gain, weight loss, or no effect. Um, so uh, with that uh, a caveat, I'll talk a little bit about clinical data warehouse in uh, warehousing in general 
and at our institution. So what kinds of questions we can answer, the challenges of what's easy and what's hard. So what's a clinical data warehouse? Electronic health records that uh, have been implemented in many of our institutions are uh, designed for managing data about an individual. So for example, what is John Smith's weight? These are what I would call within patient questions. In contrast, a data warehouse it may contain the same data in, in aggregate and about the same patients, but is uh, turned on its side, if you will. It's good for answering uh, questions across patients. Uh, the components of a data warehouse, uh, you have the hardware and software infrastructure. Uh, you have, uh, importantly, the processes and procedures that govern how you access the data. How do the data make it in? How you, uh, who's allowed to um, access the data and so on. And then there are issues related to the data themselves. Uh, importantly, clinical data are very different from research data, and a lot of work is required to make sense of these clinical data. That in and of itself <coughs> is an active area of, of research. And if you look uh, on this slide, the stuff at the bottom is a lot harder than the stuff at the top. The, uh, you know, the hardware and the software infrastructure is pretty well established. There are lots of different approaches to this. There are, there are many ways that, that have been developed in industry and in academia for dealing with um, the data at, at scale in, in various forms. The stuff at the bottom is, is still a challenge. At our institution, uh, we have data from our practice plan uh, housed in, an, um, in a uh, I, uh, warehousing platform called I2B2. Um, we have uh, some data on about 4.3 million patients. Uh, that's as of last Thursday. These data are updated daily. Uh, and so these counts literally change daily. And this is the URL where you can get the counts from uh, the late, last time it was updated. Um, with these data, we have four general kinds of activities that take place. We, have, uh, we do various kinds of primary informatics research. Uh, for example, natural language processing. How do we take unstructured text and, and uh, identify concepts in that text, for example? We have applied informatics research. So for example, we might want to identify people with a particular condition. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. It turns out that in the general medical center, it's uh, non-trivial to identify patients who have a particular condition. Uh, we conduct various kinds of uh, clinical or public health research, uh, often in collaboration with our clinical partners, um, having to do with drug repurposing or um, biosurveillance. We participate in research networks, and I'll talk about that in just a bit. And then we have various kinds of service activities, um, service to clinical administration. So for example, identify all the unsigned notes uh, and uh, tell us who's supposed to sign them. Dashboards that have been mentioned previously. So uh, recently we were involved in a project where there was a dashboard emergency, as I call it. We had to uh, create 40-some dashboards in a couple, three months. So that was done. Um, the problem, of course, is are the data in those dashboards accurate? And we can talk about that in a bit. So the traditional view is we, you know, the, uh, the patient is seen by the doctor in the upper left there. The, uh, the patient, uh, uh, excuse me, the doctor then has to enter these data somehow emergently into, the, uh, into a medical record, um, the EHR, and then we load them into a data warehouse. Ideally, we combine them with genetic data, uh, which come from somewhere magical, um, uh, uh, and then we mine these data, and then the, uh, we publish in the New England Journal, and then we repeat. The problem, uh, this, this has not been the, uh, a pattern that is reproducible. Um, and for multiple reasons. One reason is that there is a big difference between um, uh, uh, administrative data, which are prevalent in electronic health records. They're prevalent because in order to get paid, you have to enter certain data. Um, and clinical reality. And there, uh, there is a relatively uh, shall we say, uh, inconsistent relationship between administrative reality and clinical reality. So, and I'll talk about that in just a bit. So for some, um, uh, I, I, just as an example, so a clinical question might be, find me all the patients that have breast cancer. An administrative answer to that is, find me all the patients who have been billed for breast cancer. Um, if, the, if those are equivalent to you, and for some, uh, for some tasks they are in fact equivalent, great. That works well, we know how to do that, right on. 
If the answer is no, then, uh, then it's, it's harder. And by the way, it's not mutually exclusive. You can have a combination of both. So for some projects, administrative data are okay. Maybe uh, administrative data are a good start to something you want to do and so on. So I mentioned high throughput phenotyping. And so that's identifying individuals with a particular uh, uh, a problem or a particular set of problems. And it's a surprisingly hard problem. So these are data from our um, uh, data warehouse a few years ago. We looked for patients who have or have had breast, uh, or have currently or have had in the past breast cancer and endometrial cancer. And we looked at billing data as uh, in terms of their ability to define it. So if you just look at billing data, you'll miss about uh, half the breast cancer patients and you'll miss about three quarters of the endometrial cancer patients. And that has to do with um, whether or not there's a good uh, set or well-defined, I should say, a set of billing codes for endometrial cancer, which it turns out there isn't, relative to breast cancer. And this matches national data as well. There are all sorts of issues with data cleaning, so uh, uh, having to do with uh, things that I won't have time to talk about, given the time limitations. Um, uh, simple examples include uh, duplicate records or overloaded records, so where you have one person having more than one record or more than one person sharing the same record. Um, turns out that these kinds of issues have clinical consequences that are measurable, um, particularly with respect to missed labs. So if you have more than one record in, a, in the database, uh, abnormal labs that have been resulted for you are more likely to be missed by your clinician. Um, and so these uh, quote unquote IT problems have clinical consequences. In terms of users, we have uh, two uh, classes of users, if you will, informaticians who tend to want access to all of the data because they want to test various algorithms, and then clinical and translational researchers who often don't want access to any of the data. They want us to access the data on their behalf to answer particular questions, generally about fairly well-defined uh, subsets of patients. So for example, uh, find me all the uh, patients with COPD that will be seen in my clinic in the next uh, next two weeks so that I can recruit them for a study, for example. So what's hard? Validating the answers. So if I, I, it's pretty easy for me to get an answer to a question. What's hard is knowing whether it's true or more precisely um, uh, uh, under what con uh, uh, assumptions or in what um, uh, context is it true. So in other words, getting at clinical reality. There are various limitations of routinely collected clinical data. Often the picture is not complete, particularly at the Texas Medical Center where a patient might get their cardiac care at Baylor and their uh, uh, primary care at UT and then uh, 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 travel between the institutions. So at UT, they look like a primary care patient and at Baylor, they look like a, uh, just a cardiac patient. There are various non-random biases. So for example, sicker patients get more aggressive therapy. That's uh, right and appropriate, but it leads to a fairly skewed uh, view. So uh, you will find that people who get more aggressive therapy get worse outcomes, uh, which is, uh, is perhaps not uh, something you would want to act on. Uh, relatively simple things like finding patients who have died may not be trivial, um, and so on. What's easy? Uh, if data are available in structured form, they're easier to work on than uh, free text. Uh, the data that are available in structured form tend to be billing data, uh, demographics, and so on. And again, I talked about the limitations in relationship to clinical reality. Quality and safety tend to be um, uh, app uh, good application areas because they are often designed to work on, uh, on administrative type data. Drug recalls is something that uh, has come up for us, and that's relatively uh, uh, manageable. A new model of doing research, and this is an old screenshot, but I like this one more than the current version of the website, it, it has to do with research networks. So institutions have uh, developed these data warehouses and have gotten together in networks, some of which are funded by um, uh, various government or pseudo-government agencies like BCORI. If you don't know what that means, don't worry. Um, to conduct um, uh, research on much larger populations. Uh, and so there are various... Uh, 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 projects across the country called CDRN's Clinical Data Research Networks. Uh, uh, we participate in one that's led by Harvard and uh, uh, field a number of uh, queries every, um, every week or so uh, to, uh, that might be either preparatory to research or, or for research studies. So this is an, uh, an increasingly common and increasingly important way to do research. Um, 
and uh, institutions really want to participate in research networks because that leads to the opportunity to uh, to participate in, in uh, new trials or new uh, new uh, projects. It really changes what kind of research you might do. So, for example, one uh, study that was done on, on these networks had to do with uh, the uh, uh, a proper dose of aspirin uh, uh, for um, uh, uh, for prevention of heart disease, and. No drug company is going to fund a study for a drug that's A, cheap, and B, off, uh, off patent for hundreds of years. And so I, I realize I'm out of town. Two more slides. Um, uh, and uh, particularly for the numbers that would be required. So for this study, uh, they were looking for 20,000 patients across 400 institutions. And that's just not something you can do uh, with a typical uh, you know, NIH R01. Um, uh, uh, in addition to technology, these, uh, this kind of research requires co uh, collaboration between the clinical and the regulatory parts of an institution or uh, machinery of an institution, and is, of course, an opportunity for institutions. All right, so we talked about what a clinical data warehouse is. Um, it's a database uh, uh, with processes. Uh, and a way to interpret the data. It's an uh, important enabler for uh, what we uh, like to now call the learning healthcare system. And can already be, uh, these things can already be useful and have been used for a number of uh, projects that I haven't had time to look uh, to discuss. Uh, however, there are many challenges, both on the uh, technical and the social and political aspect. So uh, there are some risks in this uh, research. Uh, I, I would say that uh, informatics kind of tends to be in the upper right with chemistry and uh, maybe with microbiology. Uh, so there are some risks to privacy, of course. Um, perhaps even bigger risks uh, have to do with misinterpretation or drawing erroneous conclusions from these data. And with that, I'd like to end and acknowledge uh, our funding sources our, and our teams. Thank you very much. Okay, so one quick question. Anybody? Yeah. You mentioned how difficult it is uh, taking data from one institution versus another. They look like one sort of patient at one place and a different one. Even when you look at, like, say, heart patients at various different institutions around the country, it's totally different. So the model that you built from California is different from New York. Yeah. So how do you, what's your thought on, on handling that? And the second part is normalization of data. So a patient comes in, maybe they're getting three tests a day, the first day they're there, by the fifth day they're only getting it once a day. How do you normalize those tests based on yeah, uh, so th those are great questions. I don't know that I have time between, uh, uh, because I'm, stan I, I'm very acutely aware that I'm standing between you and food. A and in Houston, that's a dangerous thing to do. Yeah, we can talk about that afterwards. Uh, but quickly, um, uh, number one, um, uh, there are, uh, what I talked about was that um, we don't have closed systems. And so it's not so much normalizing the uh, data, which is an issue. That's, that's, a, that's a big issue. It's not, it's not just normalizing the data uh, from institution one to institution two to make them comparable. It's that even knowing that the other data exist, right? Um, uh, that's number one. Number two, George Ripshack at Columbia talks uh, uh, very eloquently about clinical data being a, uh, if you will, bio I'm, I'm paraphrasing, biology filtered through process. Right? So there are all sorts of uh, clinical uh, processes and patterns that affect what you see in the data that have nothing to do with biology, right? Or, or some have something to do with biology. But, um, uh, and so particularly with data science, this isn't exactly the question you asked, but uh, it gives me the chance to comment on this. A colleague of mine named Bill Hirsch uh, reported on a, um, a, a, a data science meeting that he went to where the, uh, there was a discovery presented um, that uh, found that patients who had arteriovenous fistulas, these are devices for access, uh, uh, to access the blood for uh, patients with renal failure to get dialysis, tended to get, have renal failure more often. And so, so you know, uh, how do you draw conclusions, you know, the association, causation, all of that. Uh, normalization is an issue. There are some standards, particularly for administrative data. Uh, once you wander away from administrative data, it becomes harder. Uh, sampling uh, issues that you refer to are clearly uh, are a clear example uh, uh, of bias that we have to deal with. Uh, again, sicker patients get more aggressive therapy. Does that mean you should avoid aggressive therapy? So, all right. Thank you so much.